Another round of AFL action is in the books, and if you're a Richmond fan, this round has been topped off with an incredibly sour note, one that has shaken the AFL to its core within the last few hours. All of that and more discussed in today's video as we reflect on round 10 before locking in our tips for round 11. Sit back, relax, let's get this one underway. Before we even turn our attention to round 10, which was a round that I didn't really tip all that well, the week just keeps getting worse for Richmond fans. If it wasn't bad enough that we had to endure a one-point loss to Essendon this past weekend for the Dreamtime at the G Clash, it has been breaking news in the past few hours since this video has been recorded that Damian Hardwick is set to quit from Richmond, and this caught me off guard and then some. I sometimes get a little bit of inside knowledge about what's going down at the club because I've got some connections down there, but absolutely nobody saw this coming. This is a man that started at our club back in 2010, but by the end of 2016, everyone wanted his head on a silver platter, um, and this man was backed in. Brendan Gale came out with his plan. Everybody laughed him off. Everybody laughed Dimmer off. And 13 years later, we have three premierships. We have become a destination club. We are a powerhouse club. Some refer to a Richmond dynasty. What this man has done for Richmond cannot be understated. He is a absolute legend of the game. And it's just come as a shock that he's leaving so soon. Um, it's been broken over many news outlets. Apparently, he will be having a meeting with the Richmond boys and staff tomorrow morning, tomorrow being Tuesday, and then it'll be announced in a press conference that he will be leaving pretty much effective immediately. They think that he might not even coach this weekend against Port Adelaide, and Andrew McWalter will be stepping up as interim coach for the remainder of the 2023 season. Huge news. And for whatever reason he's leaving, it is being reported that one of the main reasons is burnout. And obviously his life has been in the media in a big way over the last few years, obviously with the separation of his wife and the affair that he had with one of the uh, young girls at the Richmond Football Club and everything else. When I say young girl, she she's an adult, okay? Don't, don't read into that too much. But... We know his life, just like the lives of many within the AFL system, are always plastered on the media, and he's just feeling tired. He's the longest-serving um, AFL coach to date. I mean, this is coming into his 13th year. He's, he's borne the brunt of a lot, and if he walks away from the game, I have no, no hard feelings. I've got nothing but respect for the man. But it brings up more questions. As a Richmond fan... I start to see some patterns here with how, you know, Noah Cumberland has been on the out for a lot this, this year. Like, he's been targeted directly. Um, some of the players haven't been living up to their potential that I know that they can deliver. So, behind closed doors, are we having a situation, perhaps, where players have been frustrated with the coaching of the team, so they haven't been delivering their best. I, I don't know. That is just speculation. Please don't read into that all too much. But I think there's a lot more than just burnout at play here. Um, at least he leaves us in a situation with a team that is very capable. We've managed to rebuild on the fly a lot better than many teams have in recent years. And even though we're going to see players like Jack Rewalt, Trent Cochin, Dustin Martin... You know, Dylan Grimes, those type of players within the next one to two years leaving our system. We've still got a good young core that is going to carry us through for the next, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And I'm very excited to see what the future holds for Richmond, especially post Hardwick era. Um, keep your eyes peeled later on today, because obviously I'm, I'm dropping this on a Tuesday. Um, by the time this video comes out, the press conference might have already very much gone down. But yeah. Very sad news today if you're a Richmond fan. Very sad news. And speaking of sad news, we kick off the Round 10 recap with Port Adelaide hosting Melbourne down at Adelaide Oval, where I said I thought Melbourne was going to get up over the line, and in a very good game of football, a lot of people saying it is the best game of football they have seen this year. 
come down to a kick in it. There was only four points the difference separating Melbourne and Port Adelaide by the final siren. It was a very average night in the way of weather. It was pissing down rain. I actually thought that suited Melbourne better, but Port Adelaide just had the answers. They kept coming back and they kept coming back and they kept coming back. And when Melbourne would start coming back a little bit, Port Adelaide would then put the foot down and really run away with the game. Zach Butters really coming into his own. And we know this is a player historically that over the last couple of seasons has had a really bad run with injury. But now that he's injury free and he's having a good run at it, he's showing a lot of people what he is truly capable of. And a lot of people are talking about how good Connor Rosie is. I feel Zach Butters has a bigger upside. He's got more... Oh, there's just something about him that I think he can go to another level that Rosie can't. And I think we saw that on Friday night against Melbourne. Very upsetting to see players like Max Gorn like struggle in this game, where I thought against a team that doesn't really have a Ruckman that is all that chop, he, he had a really average game. And Clayton Oliver has ended up coming out of this game with a hamstring injury, which is going to see him out for the short term. So this could harm Melbourne pretty pretty much in a big way moving forward because Clayton Oliver's work in the midfield, I think we all know how good of a player he is, but if we take him out of that situation, I feel it leaves too big of a hole for Melbourne to fill. He is a contested ball-winning beast, regardless of whether you think he handballs the ball out or throws or whatever the case may be. He finds a lot of it and he uses it well. And... I think his absence is going to hurt Melbourne in the short term that he's out for. Short term, normally probably about three to four weeks. Um, but Port Adelaide, again, putting the foot down and showing that they're going to be a top four lock this year. But I still feel we shouldn't be judging Port Adelaide on their home and away season because we know they have had good years in the home and away season, even finishing, you know, number one on top of the ladder but they have failed to deliver come finals. And I think it's when finals roll around that we can really get a gauge on where they're at. But as far as premiership contention goes currently, there's probably five teams in my mind that can win the premiership this year. And Port Adelaide have entered that window in a big way. North Melbourne hosted Sydney at Marvel Stadium in one of the most controversial finishes we have had in years. And I think the AFL need to have an answer to this. I don't know whether they have. I've got an opinion about it, and we'll talk about that in a second. Sydney ran away with a three-point win in the end. And this was a game where North Melbourne surprisingly dominated the bulk. With a minute 50 left on the clock in the final quarter, North Melbourne made one more interchange than they should have. They had already reached their interchange cap. They did another interchange, and that means by the letter of the law, a free kick is paid to the opposing team, and a 50-meter penalty is paid on top of that as well. It is it is a very critical uh, ruling and free kick to give away, but it happened. Unfortunately, if it happened at the 1 minute, one minute 50 mark, why was it only brought to the umpire's attention with 50 seconds left on the clock when Sydney were dead in front of goal? Hardly any time left if the if the player given the free kick takes the full 30 seconds. Couple of questions here. I feel, is there not somebody on the boundary line to let the um, interchange stewards from each team know that you've reached your cap, you can't do any more? I, I don't know. I feel there should be. And then... Why was a whole minute gone before it was raised to the attention of the umpire? Was that strategic by Sydney in doing so that they knew that if they had done it at a certain point in time, they could steal the game and North Melbourne didn't have a, an avenue to stand on to come back? I don't know. I just feel North Melbourne were robbed by the weirdest of circumstances. The Bulldogs hosted Adelaide at Mars Stadium. This is the third week in a row that I have backed against the Bulldogs, and the third week in a row the Bulldogs fucking showed me up. Oh, Christ, I don't think I'll be making that mistake again. I really thought Adelaide would take it to the Bulldogs. I didn't realize at the time, however, some of the crucial outs that Adelaide would have against the Dogs. No 
Tom Dode in the back line was huge. Tex Walker would have been a game changer up forward. Um, oh, it's just Adelaide didn't look like the team they have been all year. This is probably the worst I have seen Adelaide play all season. And this is a team that I've been singing the praises of all year. This is a team that I said would be the biggest improvers for 2023, that I said at this point in time look like a top eight lock. And they came out and played football like this. And it was very upsetting to watch, especially if you tipped them. The Bulldogs, on the other hand, really starting to come through with some quality football. And it is on the back, yet again, of players like Marcus Bontempelli and Tom Libertore lifting their game to a whole new level. Aaron Norton was flying for everything. Cody Waitman's position in this team can't be understated. He plays a really good role, and so does Bailey Williams. You know, players that you don't expect to stand up and have that big of an influence are having influence around the ground. Do I think Bulldogs can win the Premiership this year? I think they're just outside of that five, but they're surprising a lot of people. And weirder shit has gone down this year. So who even fucking knows what's going on? Speaking of weirder shit, Fremantle hosted Geelong and absolutely belted Geelong at home. Who fucking saw that coming? Because I surely didn't. It was... It was a game that Geelong never got out of first gear. It is a game that I really thought players like Tom Hawkins and Jeremy Cameron would really get off the chain. They had players like Brad Close... Uh, Jack Henry, Tyson Stengel coming back into the team. These are players that when Richmond beat Geelong the week prior, a lot of people weren't singing the praises of Richmond's win, but more so pointing out the fact that Richmond beat a Geelong team that had a lot of players missing. These three players are critical components to Geelong winning the Premiership last year. These are three players that have had impact in every single win that Geelong have had over the last 12 to 24 months of football. And not even bringing them back into the mix was a, was enough to really shift anything. I I was really shocked to see how easy in the end some of the ball movement was for Fremantle. And just, you know, being able to move the ball out of transition from back line to forward line. It now raises question marks as to where Fremantle really truly sit. Because we've seen them struggle against teams that they should beat. Then they come out and smack teams that we're predicting they're going to lose against. I, I really don't know. It's up in the air. And then with Geelong as well, I I really don't think on the back of the wins they were having most recently, if you had said they would go back to back and lose to Richmond and then Fremantle, you would have been told you were fucking crazy. And yet here we are, and it's gone down that way. The Q Clash saw Brisbane take on the Gold Coast in a game that... Brisbane won in the end quite convincingly, but for a period of time, Gold Coast were hanging in for the fight, and every time Brisbane would edge away, the Gold Coast would come back with a couple more, and it was making the game really interesting. And then Brisbane thought, you know, fuck it, let's get out of second gear here, let's put the foot down, and they just blazed away with the game, and they just took them to town and looked like a team... That is very much in position to win the Premiership this year. Brisbane had a really rocky start to start the season off, but the turnaround this club has made and the wins that they've been able to execute and the way that they play the game, I think as a collective, regardless of where they're sitting on the ladder currently, they're definitely one of the best teams in the comp right now. Um... Their, their game style, I really love the, the in and under of their midfield. I love the intercept and rebound press that the defensive, you know, group have. The avenues to score up forward with Brisbane. Just the amount of players you can get the ball to. It just, you know, Danaher, Gunston, Hipwood, Charlie Cameron, Lincoln McCarthy, Zach Bailey. Keep listing names. You'll fucking, they'll, they'll do damage for you. And another late fade out by the Gold Coast has us wondering where they're really at as a club. They they hang in for so long and they just let it run away. I made a comment during the game. I, I turned to my old man and I said to him that even though the Gold Coast have lost a lot of games this year, even in their losses, they have shown a lot of improvement as a club and as a collective this year has been some of the best football we have seen them play in a very long time. 
But to be in an arm wrestle for so long and then end up losing this game by 40 odd points, where does that leave them as a club mentally? I, I really don't know where the Gold Coast are at right now, but Brisbane, they're on cloud nine. Speaking of Cloud9, that's definitely where I fucking wasn't because the dream time at the G clash for the first time in 13 or 14 years saw Essendon defeat Richmond. In a game where we were three goals up and let it slip with five minutes to go. It's the story of Richmond's fucking life, isn't it? And in the dying moments of the game, decisions were made on the field that shouldn't have fucking been made i i still can't get my head around the fact that jack rewalt after having an incredibly poor night makes the decision instead of holding up the ball in a contest and getting a ball up and draining some time off the clock decides to just kick the ball off the ground almost 40 meters directly to an essendon opponent and they they catapult and set up a fucking goal oh i'm 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 not gonna i'm not gonna dive into it i'm gonna try to keep my composure with five minutes to go, I thought we had the game done. And then players like Jake Stringer, who had been quiet all night, fucking just rolls into 50 and kicks a goal. And they can't manage to lock down a young kid at the top of the goal square with 50 seconds left. And, oh. I think it just leaves a very sour note, considering we now know that Damien Hardwick is going to be announcing that he's leaving the Richmond Football Club, effective immediately. It's, um... It's a shame too, because I would have hoped to have thought that Damian Hardwick would have stuck around for Trent Cochin's 300th game, and he's not going to be there as a coach for that. And I think that speaks volumes as well as to the decision that's being made. So I don't know whether it's abrupt. I don't know. I don't know why this decision is being made, but it's being made. It's been a terrible fucking few days for Richmond. And on the flip side, Essendon win a game that not many backed them to win and with the next two games that they have back to back west coast and north melbourne they really set up an opportunity to play finals this year which surprisingly richmond is still only two wins out of the top eight i don't fucking know, i don't know how that is even feasible and possible but it is and stranger things have happened i really feel this loss to essendon though is going to hurt richmond in any possible way of making the top eight by the end of the year but it was it was good to see Essendon fans get a win, as much as it broke my fucking heart. Speaking of broken hearts, West Coast would have been bitterly disappointed because fucking hell. How Hawthorne can win by almost 120 points is beyond me. I knew playing down in Tasmania would have Hawthorne in a better position than West Coast. I did not feel this smacking was coming. And this just speaks volumes to where West Coast are at with their injury list and how badly they're struggling on the field. It was pointed out recently that they have lost more games by over 100 points in the last two to three years than they have won games. They have won only a handful of games out of their last 40-odd. And the last time somebody ran a similar, uh, you know, a similar set of outcome to what West Coast are playing like was when the Bears were in the competition and the Bears were shut down and, and became, you know, they became the Lions. I'm not at all suggesting the West Coast need to be shut down, but fuck, that just puts you into a perspective of how long it's been since we have seen a team struggle this badly. This is a team that five years ago won a grand final. I can't get my head around the drop-off that we have seen so drastically. I just, mm, man, I'm, fucking, I'm left without words to talk about West Coast every week, and this week is just, it, it's even worse. And then on the flip side, Hawthorne have had conversations had this year about them tanking um, you know, for their number one pick and trading off players like Mitchell and O'Meara to make sure that they finish on the bottom of the ladder because Harley Reid is going to be a generational player, blah, blah, blah. But I think they put a lot of talk to rest when they come out and win by almost 120 points. That's not a team that is setting themselves up to fail. This is a team that has come out and made a statement. This is a team that is saying, yes, we're losing games, but we're not setting ourselves up to be in that position. Man... 
it was fucking impressive to see Hawthorne get up in a big way. It really was. It has been a long time since we've seen them click like that. But this is what I'm saying. When they click like this, you know, in a couple of years' time, when all of these players are really hitting their peak, I told you they're going to be fucking dangerous, and we got a taste of it last week. I, I fucking warned you. Speaking of getting warned, what a perfect way to segue into the Carlton versus Collingwood game, where we all knew Collingwood was going to win. Come on, let's let's face it. It was over at quarter time. It was like 32 to 8 or something at quarter time. I, I was listening on the radio and it was heading into the last quarter when I was listening on the radio and they made a, a comment that, you know, they were trying to work out the crowd numbers and they were like, oh, do you reckon there's about 95,000 in here today? And I'm pretty sure it was Daisy Thomas that popped up and turned around and said, oh, I don't know. Most of the Carlton fans would have gone home at quarter time. And a lot of people would probably think that's a little bit of a low blow. But considering in back-to-back -back weeks, we saw Carlton supporters leaving before three-quarter time and walking out of the stadium, really shows where the, the supporters' heads are at. And I, I seriously, on a personal level, I can't, I can't justify leaving a game early. I really can't. I never have. And that has been whether we've been on the... Richmond's been on the end of a 10-point... You know, 10-point win, 10-goal loss. Um, Collingwood, though, again, just finding a way to get it done. And Darcy Moore, I think he was... He... I looked, I looked back and, and he wasn't robbed. But he set a new record for intercept marks in a game. And then they determined with champion data that the mark... One of the marks was done as the siren went so it didn't count and he's just tied for the record little bit of a little bit of a takeaway from a one of a you know career defining games for Darcy Moore especially as a captain but this is what i'm saying Collingwood this year as a collective have been the the standard bearers when you've got players like Darcy Moore who he's always been a good player but he's never been in the mix to say that you know if you could pick you know, six defenders in the competition definitively. He's never always been in that conversation. He might have been in a conversation here or there, but not everyone would say Darcy Moore, 100%. But he's really elevating his game to a new level and everyone around him is getting better. And this is a team that almost the potential feels limitless with these guys. It, it really does. And, you know, when you've got players like Darcy Moore backing it up up one end and then Mason Cox is playing himself into form up the other end and then young players that haven't had much opportunity like Ash Johnson coming through the system and he's really relishing opportunity and Nick Dacos keeps adding strings to his bow they're going to be hard to beat I feel Collingwood have already got one hand on the premiership this year I, I really feel that it's going to be Collingwood versus blank and you're going to have to be incredibly fucking good to knock them off at the MCG on grand final day and the final game of the round again in an arm wrestle that ended up coming down to the wire with a very contentious 50 meter penalty i might add st kilda defeated gws by 12 points and the contentious 50 i just mentioned was against uh xavier o'halloran and he was called to come back a couple of meters off the mark but it doesn't help when the umpire is calling you the wrong name he was calling him brent referring to brent daniels and if I'm standing on the mark and somebody is saying somebody else's name, I'm not going to fucking know that they're saying to me, it's me that needs to come back. So I think common sense was thrown out the window a little bit here. Um, but it was good to see Max King back at it for St. Kilda. As I said, for weeks and weeks and weeks, once they got him back into the mix, they would start playing a better brand. And we've seen them drop off in recent weeks, but him coming back in now... And seeing players like Jack Steele and Sinclair after a quiet week, the week prior, coming in and playing really dominant performances. This is the St. Kilda the fans want to see up and about. Unfortunately, GWS fell short, even with Toby Green back in, but they played a more competitive brand. And a lot of people had GWS finishing, you know, within the bottom few. I feel GWS have a mix right now that once these younger kids start getting some more exposure and some game time, that they can really catapult themselves. But at the moment, I don't know. I think they're going to fall a little bit short of the mark, but I don't think they're going to be as bad as what people thought they were going to be.
So unfortunately, an incredibly average tipping round for myself. Five out of nine with two games that fell short by under a goal. I would have taken seven out of nine. I would have happily taken Melbourne over Port and Richmond over Essendon to take the seven. However, there were three teams that managed to tip eight out of nine this week. And those teams were Dusty Fendoff 4, Rockstar Pool 69, and Iden Cash. Congratulations to the three of you for managing to get the most correct amount of tips this week. But as we turn our attention to the top of the leaderboard, we have had a bit of a shift, ladies and gentlemen, because Benny Craig has dropped down into equal first, but sitting in second position with Rockstar Pool 69, with the eight out of nine tips this week, managing to jump up to first overall, winning by total margin quite comfortably. Fucking bastard. No, but seriously, congratulations to the both of you gentlemen for holding it down at the top. I've dropped out of the top 10, unfortunately, down to 13th, but I'm only one win out of the top 10. I'm five behind the lead. Can I, can I make up some ground? I don't know. It's becoming hard when I'm trying to tip teams that other people don't, and then they fucking lose. This week, however, I might just be making some bold moves that could move me up a little bit more or have me drop down the ladder faster than fucking I did this week. Round 11 kicks off on Friday night with Sydney hosting Carlton at the SCG. I'm going with the Swans at home. I'm going to go the Swannies by 16 points. I think Sydney, even though they fell over the line against North Melbourne, and they're in all sorts. I mean, this is a team that Sydney should have come and done big damage against, and they struggled big time. Carlton have the opportunity here to get a big upset victory against the Swans on their home deck. But I feel Sydney are going to protect their home deck incredibly strong. And when I compare the two teams over the last couple of weeks, even though Sydney haven't been playing the best, Carlton have been playing a hell of a lot worse. And when you're throwing, for lack of better words, when you're throwing crap against crap, you've got to pick the, the, the least crap smelling crap. And it's Sydney. Saturday. Marvel Stadium, St. Kilda taking on Hawthorne. Although Hawthorne managed a huge scalp over in Tasmania, St. Kilda getting it done against GWS and finding their groove again, I think really sets them up for a big win here. Um, Hawthorne very well could knock off St. Kilda again, another game that could come down to a 50-50, but I feel GWS provide a bigger, a bigger opponent than what West Coast are currently going to present. So, St. Kilda coming off of the win against GWS versus Hawthorne coming off the win of West Coast. I think I take St. Kilda. Saturday afternoon, later on, down at the MCG, we've got Melbourne hosting Fremantle. And even though Fremantle managed a huge win over at home, I don't think they get it done against Melbourne. Could they capitalise without Clayton Oliver in the team? I feel they could, but I don't think they will. I think Melbourne, after... A very close loss away are going to come home and look for a little bit of retribution. Later on that afternoon at GMHBA Stadium, Geelong take on GWS. Geelong back at home after the touch-up they copped are going to be licking their chops for a big win here. And unfortunately, GWS are about to wander into what could be a 40-point loss. I think Geelong are going to bounce back in a big way this week. TIO Stadium later Saturday night sees the Gold Coast hosting Bulldogs. I'm not making a mistake. I'm not making it four in a row. Bulldogs are winning this week because if I tip against them, they're going to fucking prove me wrong. They're playing really good football and it is very hard at the moment to back against them. There, I said it, Rockstar Pool 69. Optus Stadium Saturday night, last game of Saturday, sees West Coast hosting Essendon. Essendon, after the way they played against Richmond, I don't see them losing to West Coast here. If they lose to West Coast, they've got problems. Um, this could be another percentage-boosting win for Essendon as well, especially given that they're wanting to play finals and they'll probably finish between anywhere from 7th to 10th, probably, on the ladder this year. Um, they're going to want to pick up percentage-boosting wins, and this week and next week is a big opportunity for them to do so. Sunday afternoon kicks off at the MCG with Richmond taking on Port Adelaide. Now... I'm going to do something outrageous here. I'm going to tip Richmond, right? Now, it's not because we're playing at home. It's not because I'm being a dickhead tipping my team. Whenever we have seen a caretaker coach step up and take over the reins in their very first game, we have seen all of them get up and win. 
I am backing Andrew McWalter to get up and get Richmond over the line against Port Adelaide this week. And I think we're going to see a different Richmond play because McWalter is going to come and maybe throw a little bit of spice into the mix. This is going to be a test to see where the playing group is at in the way of being under Damian Hardwick versus being under somebody else. Because if they come out looking like a different team, there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than we thought. I actually do give Richmond a chance here. Port Adelaide are probably going to win though, but I, I, I've got to go with a gut feeling and I've got to support that, you know, in, interim coach stepping up into a role thing. You Go check out the fucking history books for yourself. It's, it's written itself. Collingwood taking on North Melbourne at Marvel Stadium. I think we, we all know how that's going to play out. This is going to be a big win for the Pies. The Hot Pies. And even though Adelaide are back at home at Adelaide Oval, I think Brisbane have played too good of a brand. They're going to go down to Adelaide Oval and pick up a big win. So my tips for the weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Sydney, St. Kilda, Melbourne, Geelong, Western Bulldogs, Essendon, Richmond, Collingwood, and Brisbane. For those of you who are playing the Gauntlet and Minimum 5, Minimum 5 starts this week. So make sure you tip at least 5 out of 9 to stay in the running weekly for that. And if you were stupid and you tipped Richmond in round 7 to beat the Gold Coast and got eliminated like I did, I'm sorry, but if you're in the gauntlet, I hope you're doing well. That is it for another episode or video or whatever you want to call it. I'm still really deflated by this news about Damien Hardwick. Um, excited to see where the club goes from here, but incredibly sad to see the end of a legacy here if you can't tell um hope you guys enjoyed today's video if you did do me a favor and hit that like button down below be sure to subscribe if you are new as well but that's it from me guys i'm out of here good luck to your teams this weekend and as always i will catch you guys next time